the wedding of Cana. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Then the wine gave out. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to me and to you? My, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the person in charge of the banquet. So they took it. When the person in charge tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who hadn't drawn the water knew, that person called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And as we're seated, let's, let's just pray. I have this sense of the snow falling this morning. How lovely that is. Mm, beautiful as it was. I just thought that's a symbol of our hearts. And let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, would you fill our hearts all the things that freeze us within and open us to receive and to celebrate your presence and your word this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's a fantastic story, one of my favourite ones. Uh, so I hope you've got a good hour and a half now and you're sitting comfortably. Um, but I'm going to start somewhere else. I'm going to start with asking you a question. I'm inviting you to do that thing that I hate doing, which is think about something and maybe talk to your neighbour about it. Um, or maybe that, that would be up to you. But let's start. I want you to think, if you would, of a time when you've known something that other people haven't. A time when you know something but other people around you don't. Maybe one or two others do, but... So, it could be a great secret. Could be a little secret. Secrets sometimes can be told, need to be told, sometimes they need to be kept secret, don't they? When you think of secrets, maybe. Might be something nobody else was interested in, but you were really enthusiastic about it, but nobody else seemed interested. Do you want to try and enthuse them, or do you just keep quiet? Maybe, um, there's a decision made at your workplace that you could think of, and you didn't agree. You knew the person chosen for a particular job would actually do it really badly. But do you say something? Do you keep quiet? You know somebody's going for an interview. You know there's something that might not come out. Do you speak of it beforehand? There's something you know that others don't. Do you keep quiet or not? Perhaps you're a gardener and you see your neighbour, you're beginning to get to know a bit and they're planting vegetables or you know, flowers, but you're a bit of an expert and you know they're planting them in the wrong place. Well, they're, they're in shade when they should have sunshine or the wrong time of year and you know they're just going to die. Do you just smile and say, that looks lovely? <laughs> Do you decide to speak out knowing that you would actually be telling them in the wrong thing, but it might actually be the kindest thing? Or maybe uh, you knew somebody who was struggling and you know if the person just sticks it in a bit longer, it might be a child, it might be another adult, actually, help is coming, or it's going to be all right. You know that, but would you speak out? So try and think of a time for a moment, one of those or something completely different, when you knew something that other people didn't, you weren't quite sure whether to speak out or not. 
So if I give you a minute to think about that, and then if you got nowhere, you could either say to the person in front or behind or beside, can you think of anything? I hate it when you do this. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a moment to think on your own or with help. Tell me you knew something and others did <coughs> it. Go. Right. I'd love to come round with a microphone and ask for your stories, and I'm sure we could uh, have some interesting ones. Um, perhaps you now know how much um, Sprouts costs in Morrison's, or... <laughs> I hope you, you, you were able to engage in a little way. Sometimes it's okay to be in the know. Uh, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes we have to speak out. Sometimes we don't know whether we should speak out. Sometimes we're afraid to say in case it spoils a relationship. Our story about Jesus and the wedding in Cana. Let's turn to that now. Four Gospels in the Scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. John is a bit different, begins differently as you will know from uh, the Christmas reading that we have. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And at the end of that section, um, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, says that end of that passage that we tend to read at Christmas. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory. There's a lot about glory in John's Gospel and in this passage uh, that comes at the start. So that's the first thing to remember. We often bring everything together when we read bits from the Bible, and we don't see that they have their own place within the particular story that we're reading. And so here, it's important, I think, um, that what's happened so far in John's Gospel is that wonderful prologue, beginning with creation, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then you have John the Baptist pointing to Jesus and saying, he's the one. And then you have Jesus gathering a few not 12 yet, but I mean, there may be 12, but we only get a few, four or five that are gathered. Uh, and so there's no miracles, there's no preaching, there's no teaching yet in John's Gospel. This is chapter 2, verse 1, and this is the first time we see Jesus doing something. Now that's important, because that means this is at the foundation of the story. The story is carefully put together and it's there for a particular reason early on to set the scene. Uh, so Jesus, let's just um, let's just paint the scene again for ourselves. So he's invited to this wedding with his mum, with uh, the disciples, probably other members of his family are there too and they run out of wine. Uh, his mum has apparently this crazy idea that he could do something about it. Mums they put us in that sort of situation, don't they? I don't know if your mum or you as a mum put yourself in that situation, put yourself, oh, don't worry, John will look after that. He'll come and help you in the garden. He'll cut your hedge. He'll do the washing up. He'll, or she, she'll, yeah, she'll, she'll fix that for you. She'll come and, uh, I don't know, uh, Janet certainly gets guilty of it. I don't know. <laughs> Tim will do that. Yes. My husband said it's not just mums. Not just mums, it's dads as well. <laughs> That's probably. Oh, I see, it's wives, I beg your pardon. Yes, yes, yes. No, let's not go there this morning, shall we? But isn't it, isn't it funny? It's lovely to see that. You know, I mean, of course, there's deep meaning behind it, but there's also a mum saying, oh, Jesus will solve that, you know. Um, and then she says to the servants, do whatever you do, after he said, no, it's not my time, it's not my time. But it's a lovely exchange. It's not an unkind exchange, despite how it's sometimes translated. It's, it's, it's a kind. Jesus is speaking respectfully and kindly to his mother. When he says woman, it's just that it has a connotation for us. Um, but it's, it, those words are, are spoken very, uh, in fact, very, very kindly. But mums can be exasperating in the situations that they put us into. And you do wonder how many times before Mary had put Jesus in this situation. <laughs> Because there's a whole load, of course, many, many years of his life that we know nothing about. But Mary had all those memories, and so did Jesus. And he said, oh, not again, Mum. Anyway, enough of that. Um, to cut a short story, even shorter, 
Jesus gets the servants to fill these six stone jars, massive quantity of water, and when uh, this water that's used for the ritual of washing hands, um, it's not used for drinking, used for washing hands, uh, not to give your hands a good scrub, but it's ritual, so you would almost dip them in or have it just poured over it. Your hands are expected to be clean anyway, but it's a ritual that points to uh, the purif purifying your heart so that when you come to receive the gift of God in food, because every food is gift from God, give us today our daily bread, um, your heart is pure. Uh, and as Jesus says elsewhere, it's more important what's inside than the outer um, ceremonies. So, these are filled. They, when, when the servants have filled them, they then take uh, the, the, the water out and it becomes wine at some stage, we don't know when, and it becomes not just wine, but the most fantastic wine. So it's a sign, and that's what the, the Greek semeon means, uh, there are several signs throughout John's Gospel, and this is the first. So it's a miracle, but it's a sign, a miracle that points to something. It points to Jesus as being God in human form, creating natural process of water turning to wine. has lots of elements, but this is a significant uh, recognition of Jesus. He is, has the power over nature, um, he reveals his glory, we're told at the end of the story, he reveals his glory, that he is the one and only who comes from the Father. Secondly, it's a sign of the tremendous change that he brings, the tremendous transformation that Jesus is bringing and will bring and we will see working out through the rest uh, of the Gospel. And the vast quantity of wine, 500 litres or more, is not to be thought of in terms of, is that really sensible to cook so much wine, they'll get drunk, won't they? It's, it's simply a symbol of plenty, and wine was so significant for Israel. Israel was often called God's vineyard, and to produce this fruit, and Jesus did it magnificently in abundance. And so often Israel produced, the, or did not produce, the fruit that God expected uh, from them. So wine represents joy and gladness, it represents indeed shallow and that peace that is not just an absence of war, but it's a provision, and very much the material provision. It is ultimately, of course, the kingdom of God, and so this is a sign of God's kingdom. So, everybody cheered as the new wine was brought out. Jesus was lifted onto their shoulders, proclaimed a hero, and everybody began to sing, Jesus is Lord of creation's voice broke off. It's not what happened, though, is it? Nobody knew. The party went on. As far as we could tell from the story, and that's presumably the point of the story, nobody knew apart from Jesus' mum, his disciples, and the servants. It's interesting who did know. People, apart from Jesus and his entourage, just the unimportant people, at least in human eyes, the servants. They knew, but nobody else did. I think this is a really significant part of the story. Now do you see why I asked you at the start? Are the times when you know something that nobody else does? And of course the disciples put their faith in him, but they put their faith in someone uh, who they know has made a magnificent difference to everybody at this wedding. But those people there in the, in the wedding, they don't know. And so, the Gospel, obviously, will, will begin to, to tell the stories. Jesus will become a, 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 a very public figure, and ultimately his glory, that glory will be seen in his death and resurrection. The final sign uh, that they see, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, and that glory seen in his death and his resurrection. The disciples are in the know. What they know leads them to put their trust in him. They have seen his glory. After his resurrection, Jesus will say to Thomas, you know the great story of doubting Thomas, um, 
who wants to touch the, the side of Jesus. I only really believe he's, he's come back and, and risen from the dead if I can put my hands into his wounds and so on. Um, and Jesus said, you have believed because you have touched and seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that's you and I. We know something. We are those who have not seen or touched, but this is, is it not, the foundation of, of our mission. Huge uh, part of why we're here on this earth at all. For me, as witnesses to the gospel, as witnesses of who Jesus is, we are not required to tell a coherent account of, of Jesus' life ministry and the theology of that and why that was necessary for the salvation of humankind and how the kingdom of God is thereby brought into being. But we are required, I think, as witnesses, to say what difference it makes to us in our workplaces, in our homes. Not to say, by the way, today I want to tell you about my faith. But when the opportunities arise, not to avoid them, but to relish them, to say, yes, this makes a huge difference to me. Yes, when you're after what you've told me, I'll pray about that. Pray? What's that? So, the last bit I want to do is to ask you. We've been talking about the transformation that Jesus makes. And this is perhaps a process, perhaps a process the church from here will take on in the coming months. But to ask, what difference does that make? What's the transformation for you? If you'd never heard of Jesus, if you could imagine that, I mean, of course you can't, but we could imagine, or imagine somebody that hasn't heard of Jesus. What is it that makes it different for you and for me? We know it doesn't make us any better because we haven't done anything, but we've heard something, we know something that many people don't know, don't believe if they've heard they don't believe, or they're unsure, or confused. But all of us are all of those things to some extent. So can I just ask you now to take a minute, just to think, practically speaking, no theology required, but practically speaking, what difference does the transformation that Jesus makes for you? It's something you can share when asked. Not on a street corner with a big sign, Jesus saves. But the real difference it makes. Can I just give you a minute? We're not almost done, but I want just to give you that minute to think. And maybe you'll need the rest of the year <laughs> to reflect on that. But can we do that now? And if, if, if it helps to say to somebody what it is, or I'm struggling with this, please do. Can you take a minute now? Yeah, so the first thing that it came to me when I asked myself the question was simply and deeply, I think, not having to carry the burdens of my own failures of knowing and believing and finding that forgiveness was a very real thing that I didn't have to carry those things with me, the things that I get wrong and constantly get wrong. And I think that's one of the ways. I'll leave you with those. And let's finish with a prayer. Father, well, thank you for that fantastic story, for all the things as we go back to it, we, we can see. When Mary said, do whatever he says. Lord, would you speak to us so that in some simple way we may hear through today, through this service, through that story, in some way you speaking to us, that we might be faithful and move a step forward on our journey with you. Thank you for the ways you do transform our lives. 
and help us to carry that faithfully and to know when to tell and how to tell the difference that you make. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank you for the world in which we live. We thank you that it is a good world. We thank you for the transforming of that world that you do through the seasons of the year, through the growth of crops, through the development of human beings as they grow. In so many ways, you transform. And we pray your blessing on those who, who work to transform for good, to nurture this earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those dark places in the world that bring darkness to our hearts, and we pray for light. We pray for light in the Holy Land, between Palestinian and Israeli, between all the nations and ethnicities of the Middle East. And we pray that the devastation in which we pray would be bringing comfort would ultimately, somehow, in your wonderful way, be the foundation of a just and lasting peace for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the people of Ukraine, of Russia, of Yemen, of South Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and all places that are in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this week of Christian unity, we pray for the church. We pray across the denominations. We pray that Christians may recognize there is one body of Christ and that we may find ways to live together, not just in peace, but in sharing together of the good news and revealing by our love for one another the Christ at the heart of all things. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray today for those who are struggling, <coughs> those known to us, friends and family, those who are part of this church, those who are grieving, those who are sick in body, mind and spirit, And we pray that you would transform to bring healing and hope. But even if the suffering remains, and we know it does, we pray that you would somehow transform it. Give people grace and strength to bear what must be born and to find joy, deep joy and gladness, even in the darkest situation. And we pray your blessing on those who are trying to do that for others at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I'm just going to gather up all the prayers that you have. I'm just going to walk from the back of church and I want you to imagine me carrying a big vat and I want you just to put your own prayers into that. Can you do that? Can you imagine that? Whatever is on your heart, and if there's nothing that comes to mind, put your heart in the big bag. You ready? I'm coming up, so I'll throw your prayers into my big vat as we come. Gather up all our prayers, all our joys and thanksgivings, our sadness, our hopes, our fears. Merciful Father, Accept these, these prayers, prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 